initially I will uh, just introduce the scope of the subject. Uh, the scope of the subject uh, is given to us is non-fiction film. And I'm very glad to see a lot of young faces uh, in the audiences particularly because it's an area in India that has got tremendous potential and somehow we not really, you know, uh, realized it. But these days I see that there's a lot of interest in non-fiction. Now, with the facilities, other things also opening up, but a lot needs to be done. So the scope of non-fiction, the range of non-fiction is what we forecast through our experience and whatever little we know in our own ways. We'll try to present in front of you. Earlier the word was like, I'm glad that they're calling it non-fiction. The earlier the word was synonymously either there was two categories, people knew newsreel and documentary. Documentary was always about issues and it was like almost we had lived through the government era of monopoly. But non-fiction film today, as any one of you have seen, has got a very, very wide range of uh, expression and possibilities. Uh, also the new digital technology, which uh, a lot of young people are taking to in a big way, uh, is also makes it easier and facilitates making films, uh, non-fiction films of various genres, various varieties, you know, for various purposes. Uh, that possibility is also, I think, opened up a lot. But there is a process, there is a conceptual understanding of the subject uh, is also needed. Unfortunately, we have very, very few training institutions and very few opportunities for people you know, who can go into documentary or non-fiction area in terms of training specifically as compared to the other countries. Also, uh, we have poss we do not have such great possibilities of exhibition of documentaries. And for instance, you can make an interesting documentary which will fire people's imagination, but you cannot show it theatrically distribution because our audiences and we just haven't built that kind of a structure. For instance, all of you would have read about Michael Moore's documentary, you know, which was released commercially like uh, any other film in USA and people paid to go and get that. We're still far away from that. But hopefully we will get there uh, someday. There are a variety of uh, definitions or ways of looking at uh, a documentary. The various definitions of documentary. I'll just briefly speak for about a couple of minutes before I hand over to the other people. There are many definitions because it's still a very, very evolving form as per the needs of society. In fact, uh, the first time the term was used was in 1920s by a man called John Grierson, who was a visionary. And he was a visionary in the sense he was a filmmaker who loved cinema and its uh, glory. But at the same time, when Chaplin and other films and fiction films were ruling, this man thought of the potential of this medium in uh, social development, debate, and strengthening of democracy. That was the very, very driving force behind Grayson, who was a British, British documentary filmmaker. And there was an American filmmaker, Robert Flaherty, who made a film called Moana. And by looking at that, people almost like a culture which was extinct. He was more of an anthropologist, Robert Flaherty. And looking at that film, Grierson described the use, Grierson described the word, uh, for use the word for the first time called documentary. And he called it as a creative treatment of actuality. Now the creative and actuality, these two words are very interesting. And they need to be kind of, you know, this is the very root basis on which this whole movement of documentary started. It has grown in Europe, it has grown in various ways. In India, we have our history. Although this is the basic uh, reference, uh, what we would do is here, I think we would pertain ourselves mostly to the Indian situation and Indian reality because that is what we are really concerned with. So what we can look at is that how has it redefined Indian realities in various ways, you know, in terms of uh, documentary. Now, to me, there, are, there have been four st uh, stages, essentially, of documentary filmmaking in India or uh, non-fiction actually. First was the state monopoly, which was the films division. And uh, it was mandatory to show the films division or reels. Either there used to be documentaries or there used to be the news reels, which gave you a sample of that. This was before the days of television. So the small news reels of ma major events in the country. And it was very strongly aligned to the development agenda of the country. You know, from the 50s when it was said that so many people are illiterate, this medium can read and this is the best chance is that to have the people in the theater. So, you know, where you reach the multitudes without that. So, this is made as mandatory 
and the various aspects of agriculture, scientific development, institutional development, various news of dignitaries visiting, cricket match, cultural events, etc. were all covered in newsreel. The other issues were covered in newsreel. And this continued for many years. And when television came also, network television showed the news value and the newsreel, the importance of newsreel got reduced, so film newsreel, films division. But the network television <coughs> later on, it was still the monopoly with the government. But alongside, <coughs> you had uh, this news, some private people started coming in. You know today as NDTV, they used to do, Pranav Roy used to do a program of the world this week. It was a news magazine for television for half an hour. From that is the beginning of these people and the private broadcasting came in and the news trap it was, the news magazines, so news trap. There were private news magazines, video cassettes started coming out, weekly, monthly, etc. That was in a small way. Uh, after the liberalization, the foreign networks, others came in and then you have dedicated channels now. Like you have Discovery, you have, you know, you know the entire works of that Animal Planet and so on and so forth. Where uh, the documentary is gone so much, it came to us late, about 20 years ago. And after that now people know that there, there could be dedicated channels, there could be dedicated programming for, you know, uh, National Geographic or Discovery and 3-4, the channels that we have, for a network. Alongside that, technologically, a big breakthrough arrived, which wasn't there in the 50s, was the digital technology. And uh, now even with school kids, you can start giving them on a simple handicam and other thing conceptually and then take them on of course amateur technology doesn't go very far but it's a useful need to start with this because the visual literacy and other thing can begin very early at this stage so these are very interesting kind of a prospect you know on which uh, we're going to look at and uh, the other questions that perhaps we would be talking about is that this is a very i said the mother of audiovisual documentation it has gone through these four phases okay so, in this <coughs> light, this is the overall kind of perspective that we have the last 50-60 years. We would also like to you know, kind of begin. And as I told you, for me, non-fiction personally began with documentary, it has newsreels, it has programs privately produced with cable television, we have seen. Social media is another very interesting kind of an element. To me, it is a very expanding form. I said that it began with creative treatment of actuality. but. Uh, Day by day, we are seeing and discovering more and more possibilities. And in India, there's tremendous scope which we have not really, you know, come up with. Now, few private agencies, few government agencies, few semi-government agencies are coming up. So, hopefully, we're looking at a better this thing. So, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Kundu to uh, come up and share his views about uh, how he sees, uh, you know, as an individual, as a non-fiction as an approach with respect to India and the future of this thing. Uh, I want you to draw you more on the future direction because he's been doing some very interesting work in the last year and a half or two nearly that he has been at Films Division. You know, uh, it's been revitalizing, getting a lot of other people. But about that and if I want to ask him slightly later, but I just want him to give his perspective on non-fiction. Uh, I'm really happy to see a, a lot of young people here because that is what non-fiction needs in India today. Now, Films Division is is the organization that I'm heading now and it's the organization that has uh, been the state wing for promotion of non-fiction in the country for a very long time. It was set up in 1948 after independence. Uh, before that, in 1942, uh, a small organization came called Information Films of India, which was set up by the British government and the, the basic mandate was to create some propaganda films to garner support for the World War II initiative of the Britishers in India. And that experience of six or seven years was enough to convince uh, everyone in the government that the government definitely requires a communication bridge. It's a very strong means of communication. Uh, when India became independent in 1947, there was no radio out of the rural areas. There was no reach of the print media there was no television. So this was the only means of communication for the government to kind of convey its message of development or the, the record of happenings around the country to the general masses. 
So what would be done was a newsreel would be created and it would be taken to the rural areas where a mela um, uh, is typically organized and a tented cinema uh, would be set up there to show them films, commercial films. But before the commercial films, the newsreels would be shown. And that is how news about the country traveled in those days. That is how my organization actually came into being. But over uh, the years, uh, the organization also started promoting the medium, the, the medium of cinema, the art form of cinema. And the first International Film Festival of India in 1952 was organized by Film Division. And that, in a sense, changed the way even fiction cinema developed in the country. And for the last 67 years, this organization has been generally, you know, uh, going from uh, one kind of contribution to another. So, animation uh, was pioneered by Films Division. Experimental documentaries, creative documentaries were pioneered by Films Division. Almost all the major directors be it fiction or non-fiction, who are working in the country today have at some point of time worked with the Films Division. They made some documentaries or they made some short films with doc, uh, Films Division. So with that background, now this organization is uh, even now trying to work uh, really uh, kind of in a focused way for non-fiction. We do promote fiction as well, short fiction as well, not the feature length fiction, but, but primarily it's a production house which focuses on non-fiction and therefore uh, we are constantly engaged with the issues that face this particular genre of films. And uh, another major thing that this organization has uh, done was they started an international film festival which is dedicated to documentaries, short films and animation films. It started in 1990. It was called BIF at that time, Bombay International Film Festival. It's held once in two years. And the 13th edition is going to be held from 3rd of February to 9th of February 2014 in NCPA at Mumbai. So I'll be talking in detail about uh, these uh, later. But primarily I see challenges uh, for non-fiction are both in terms of funding and in terms of outreach. Very few filmmakers can make a livelihood by making just documentaries or non-fiction films. Therefore, producers are not willing to put in their money much. Films Division uh, promotes and funds a lot of films. We, on an average, make about 120 films every year. But apart from that, there are very few other organizations. Most of them are, again, state organizations, Ministry of Culture, Ministry of External Affairs. Second is, even if you make, even if you get the funding in place or you put your own funding into it, outreach is, is a great uh, problem because we just haven't developed uh, the exhibition spaces, we haven't developed the audiences to appreciate or engage with this kind of cinema, which has helped, you know, you know happened elsewhere in the world. In India, somehow, it has, it has fallen by the wayside. So it's, it's always an individual's initiative that really gets any particular documentary to be screened. And which is why filmmakers like Anand Patwardhan have had to you know, develop a new paradigm for uh, public screenings of uh, documentaries that are made. As, as of now, again, there is no commercial distribution space available, neither in the cinema uh, circuit nor in the television circuit. So these are major challenges and these are the challenges that uh, as an organization I am hoping to uh, kind of address and work out a system in which I can, we can uh, help out with that. So that's, that's uh, the overall scenario or uh, the parameters within which Films Division is functioning and looking forward to. So uh, a brief introduction to that. What is it about the documentary which is different? You must be wondering, you know, because um, you talked about what differences, what different stages it has been through and so on. But you must be wondering what, it is, what is it about the documentary that they are talking about? How is it different from what we are used to seeing? So let me give you a small example and let's start with that. So, uh, in 2004, there was uh, an incident that happened in Manipur. Okay, um, 12 women, um, I mean there had been killings, rapes and so on and so on and 12 women completely fed up with what had been ha happening. And with the fact that a lot of the rapes were happening, uh, rapes by the armed forces, they took off their clothes, they stripped and stood in front of the uh, gate of Assam Rifles and held up placards saying, Indian Army, rape us. 
Okay, now this became a news item. So when you see footage of that as an episode, you get, let's put it like this, a little bit of information on television that this has happened. First thing, you get to know something has happened out in an area which is outside your consciousness. So it's like the main focus was on the people in the room. Somebody left the room. Who left the room and why that person left the room, nobody bothered about. So somebody has shifted focus to the person outside the room. Does the person outside the room have something to say? Is he or she in some pain? Has something happened? So in a sense, what television did that time was shift the focus away from our main preoccupations onto a marginal area. Second, we see for instance a kind of three months later when the episode boils up, you know, becomes very, you know, sort of uh, anguished and so on. Then there are on and every television channel there are small talk shows about it or they collect some footage around that and they show that uh, in a manner which basically poses the question that what is happening in this particular area? Let's at least try and solve the problem. I mean that is the focus of television. This is an issue this issue is to brought in front of people either through two or three talking heads and through some visuals and that's it. Now the third stage is when somebody, like I made a film there, another, there are two and I'll give you two examples now. One film is made by a person who is a local, a Manipuri. He makes a film. He shoots, he records, he chronicles a lot of the stuff that has been happening, for instance, in that one year or in the next one year. And he makes a film from the point of view of an insider, a local. And that film brings to us the huge pain of the person who has left the room, who is outside the room, nobody is talking to, who has now said, this is my pain. I'm putting it in front of you through the voice of an insider, somebody who understands that pain. Okay? That becomes a documentary. Okay? A documentary made by somebody who is located within the system. I, as a mainstream North Indian, okay? a so-called, you know, Delhiwala, Hindu, settled, part of the mainstream politics, also feel concerned about the person who's gone outside the room. And I go and make a film. My film then also collects fundamentally the same material, right? And reorganizes it from a slightly different perspective. So my perspective becomes, given the context of our politics, of our life, of what we pretend we are, what is happening here? Why aren't we focusing on this? So you know, can you see now what has happened? The same material has been dealt with in four different ways. In the way in which television deals with it, leaves you with it, gets out, not bothered what happens later, and you are not bothered, you see it as a part of images that are happening, and you leave it. Then there's a discussion which gives you a little so-called in-depth perspective. But because it has, no, it has no real clear perspective, it has no core, you are left to a certain extent untouched, sometimes you are touched, as you are touched or untouched by many TV programs that you watch. Then if you happen to watch either one film or the other of the two I'm talking about, which are two documentaries, you get a strong centered vision. That means there is a perspective, there is a core, which is defining how the material has been organized. And that gives you an experience. So when you watch that, you actually go home with an experience and say, my God, this is happening there. This is how I look at it. So that is what a documentary filmmaker primarily does. So I bring to some material which I collect my wisdom or lack of it over the decades, over the years, and I try to organize the material and present it with my perspective. So one of the most important things for a documentary to have is a perspective and not what we are told in a TV presentation. It should be perspective neutral. That get one side, get the other side, get both sides. You know. Because then it becomes superficial. Get one side, get two sides, as if this getting the two sides is actually allowing you to get a sense. We've seen many debates that happen on TV. You get one person from the BJP, one person from the Congress, one person from the Ahmadmi Party or somewhere else, and at the end of it, you're none the wiser. You've heard many people rambling away, talking away, but you don't know anything better. You go away as confused as you were before. Whereas what you need, and I think this is where it is important, and that's where I say a documentary becomes very central to the whole representation of reality that is that it organizes the material in a manner in which it gives to you a way of entering and looking at that small world i'll stop here we'll take it up from here but this i feel is something that is so essential you know because it gives to you so what happens is a documentary filmmaker therefore becomes a person whose job is 
to keep on seeing where his or her focus is and to pick up that material and present it in the manner that is most intrinsic and internal to the filmmaker so that there is a perspective because that perspective is what which what defines the material the material in itself can actually be neutral and indifferent but organizing the material in a particular manner arrangement of images gives you a broader sense thank you just to try and contextualize this whole thing a little bit step back a bit and look at it in uh, in perspective uh traditionally conventionally at least when i was growing up uh, films made by mr kundu's a uh, prestigious organization used to be mandatory before every feature film was screened and most of us used to either go out to have popcorn when we grew old or we used to go out to have a smoke because we did not want to watch those films or the news reels for for that matter so unfortunately there has been a very uh, negative perspective on what a documentary is तुम क्या करते हो मैं डॉक्यूमेंट्री बनाता रहा तो बहुत बोरिंग होती है आई आई हैव आंसर्ड दिस क्वेश्चन फॉर अ बेटर पार्ट ऑफ माय लाइफ बट आई ऑलवेज से दैट नो इट कैन बी इंटरेस्टिंग इट कैन बी एंगेजिंग इट कैन गिव यू फूड फॉर थॉट यू कैन एंजॉय वाचिंग अ डॉक्यूमेंट्री एंड टुडे एट लीस्ट मोस्ट ऑफ अस हु वॉच टेलीविजन आर एक्सपोज्ड टू द फॉर्मेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्री बी इट मेड बाय नेशनल ज्योग्राफी और बी इट मेड बाय हिस्ट्री और बाय डिस्कवरी but they are formatted documentaries those are documentaries which are preset in what they want to say uh they have a fairly uh, commercial uh, worked out format where every 7th minute or 15th minute there will be a commercial break and one segment has to end on the 7th the second has to end on the 15th third has to end on end on if it's a 21 minute 23 minute film then it has to end by the 21st minute or if it goes on to be 48 minutes then there will be about five or six breaks so these are all very formatted pre-decided pre-designed pre-scripted and a lot of research goes into these films uh, the main thing in the films that you see on national geographic or discovery is research and access you need access to either the communities or the wildlife or the climate or the nature or whatever you're talking about so you need to know that space intimately you need to engage with that space intimately you have to become a part of that space you cannot be on the outside and make a superficial film on the outside of the voice of god commentary telling you okay on your left the tipu sultan's grave observe it you know what i mean you can't do that you got to be part of the grave you got to be sitting on the grave or be a part of it or expose the grave to the world and say all right this is what the grave looks like this is how it was made this is the architecture this was the weather when it was made this was the society when it was made and these are the dynamics of the grave so that is what interests some people and that doesn't interest some people it can be engaging it can be disengaging now the purest form of documentary really is what is happening here you put a camera and you leave it there is no interference between the author or the filmmaker and the subject that is being documented or being recorded big boss everybody watches big boss yes. although there are many um, accusations of it being a pre-scripted program but that is pure documentation there are 30 cameras catching these people doing all kinds of bizarre things at all kinds of bizarre times of the of the day and night and then they become you know uh well we all get by curious pleasure of watching these people doing ridiculous things to each other <laughs> but we enjoy it well, that is documentation that is documentation in its purest form that is documentation which is which is banal at some level which is carnal at some level which is very very low which is catering to the lowest common denominator at some level and which gives us this birds eye view looking at people behave like animals and we feel yeah i am better than them so we enjoy it <laughs> that is one kind kind of documentation or documentary uh in india the the if you look at history of the documentary they were called factual films the first factual film ever made was a wrestling match at hanging gardens made by one maharashtrian gentleman called mr bhatwadekar if i'm not mistaken he made a film which was a, a wrestling match between two wrestlers now in those days the cameras used to be about probably 10 times the size of this and you needed about six people to lift it up in the first place they were all box cameras there was a fixed lens we did not have movable lenses we did not have a combination of lenses we did not have zooms nothing there was a fixed lens and once fixed fixed nobody moved that camera because to move the camera by the time you moved from one angle to the other the fight would be over so i probably just fixed the camera somewhere and covered it was a coverage like pankaj spoke about news and the perception of news 
news coverage you're just covering news without interfering supposedly in what is happening so what is it all about finally it's all about perception and projection how do we perceive or conceive our reality and how do we project it so we are reinterpreting what we see there is never any pure representation or pure documentation otherwise it will be a film like sleep with andy warhol did made he shot a woman sleeping for about 6 hours i believe and that's all there was to it now even if that woman was naked how long would you want to watch her <laughs> it'd be bloody boring so what do you need you need conflict you need something to come in the way of that person's journey or that phenomenon's journey to conflict it to stop it to somehow create a hurdle and then you start anticipating oh what will happen next in all saas bahu series that's what we end waiting ah oh, abhi iska kya hoga abhi wo maregi jathani aayegi devrani aayegi jeth kya karega hum kaha jayenge hum kya karenge and then there is a cliffhanger ab kya hoga thana ghanti baji episode khatam and we waiting till next day with bated breath allah ab kya hone wala hai god knows you know uska kya hoga jab tak tulsi zinda thi tulsi chalti rahi us din tulsi ki kahani khatam ho gayi us din saas bhi khatam ho gayi bahu bhi khatam ho gayi so the, the whole point is you keep creating an anticipation in the minds of the audience and hoping that there'll be this great uh, exploration or exposition or or some major climax is going to happen but unfortunately it turns out to be an anti climax now when we come to a documentary we are normally documenting a phenomenon we are documenting something which is in time and out of time which is progressing it is not static and it is not over ever but it becomes an important document because more often than not it is a political it brings in or it is meant to bring in at least that's what i believe that's what i've learned as a filmmaker all my life we are meant to give it a 360 degree perspective whatever may be our stance whatever may be the way we look at it whatever may be our politics whatever may be our prejudices because we are all made up of all this but in that 360 degrees you must have the sagacity and the capacity to engage your audience to understand the phenomenon in totality if you don't do that then you've not made a complete film then it's a news cover every news channel one news channel is for the bjp the other is for the congress and another is for whoever pays the money in whichever debate it's as simple as that so we are only trying to read between the lines to figure out okay what's well, what's happening today okay so therefore this may happen tomorrow or we'll never come to know what happens which happens more often than not we just see a chimera of so called reality in its representation but we are all the time trying to grapple with what is actually happening like uh, anil said i mean it's always very confusing we really don't know what's going on so the point i'm really making is that if you do feel that you can engage an audience the language of cinema doesn't change whether it's fiction or non fiction it's fundamentally the same if you feel you can engage an audience if you give your suspension some disbelief and vice versa and if you actually go in and watch a hall uh, watch a film in a hall it can be an extremely ex- interesting experience other than television we are talking about spaces like this you can sit and watch a documentary if you let go of your perception that oh it's a boring thing to watch in the first place secondly if we have spaces like this that i as a filmmaker can screen my film and each of you like i saw this in london i was there recently a couple of months ago each each person who comes and pays 10 pounds at the gate and you watch a film if i have a full house of 250 people i made 25000 bucks in one evening if i have six screenings like that oh, sorry 2.5 lakhs if i have six screenings like that i've recovered the cost of my film why can't we look at that as a possibility why can't we make these commercially viable ventures rather than just screenings for people to come and either entertain or get bored or give them food for thought why cannot we monetize this like you monetize a jai ho the reviews i've read about jai ho are abysmally bad it's supposed to be a horrible film but i'm sure it'll make 150 to 200 crores irrespective of it being a horrible film because everybody wants to see salman shake his ass right all of it oh he's so cool Yes, the same thing. If you talk about oh, somebody, some, some, someone in in society today who's probably marginalized, who's trying to fight some sort of a battle, who's trying to get over something, overcome something, which is a which is a phenomenon and movement, you won't even want to pay two rupees to go and see the same film. So that is the difference. So you need to relook at what you are wanting to see or not wanting to see, and you need to probably get away from. the tried and tested commercial material and then there's a whole world a whole world out there of very interesting films to watch thank you i think after the first round uh, we need to move this to the next level and uh, some of the points have been 
made by the earlier speakers, I'll just pick them up because everybody has spoken about the difference between documentation and doing creative work, which I started with. And the same idea was rooted through the examples of the others. Uh, as I said, that reality is always you know, defined in terms of the programs or how you see. There is never a pure objective reality. The only objective reality you will get is in the CCTVs of the ATMs. They're completely neutral. 24 hours, they will just keep on recording. Now, that's the purest kind of documentation, if you want to use that word. So that is the most neutral documentation, completely sterile documentation of use to the police and security. That's all. It's not of use to us. That's one. Then we move on. This is levels of reality. There are three levels of reality, basically cap capturing reality or dealing with reality in non-fiction according to me. One is the purest documentation. It can be very, it can be a little better than the ATM uh, CCTV. It's like what's happening here. You have speakers, and you can pro do that. In future, you can do some programs. You can do now. You can convert. You can uh, cover or record this entire debate for about one hour, and make something more out of it. At one level, it remains as a documentation. Somebody wants to follow. Somebody's missed the program, then he can. Maybe archiving later on, some years later, somebody wants to know what the research has been, he can listen to that one hour tape and know exactly who said what and what the audience questions were. Second level is you want to do something about the program. The second is what I call is uh, when you start actually doing, processing it. So that is where the newsreel and making capsules uh, comes into it. So you do a small magazine of it. You want to give a 5 minute, 10 minute kind of a sample that look we had this one hour discussion but everyone doesn't have time to watch it but you want to do a presentation of it which is what news media does. They do it for a very short time, 2-3 minutes. You want to make a capsule. Okay. So you start structuring it always. So the element of subjectivity and other thing comes in. That's also reality but it's a 10 minute version of a 60 minute proceedings that you're doing which is what news reels and other magazine programs or news magazines, video news magazines do. The third level is what we call as a proper full-fledged documentary. It's more like uh, it has to be distinguished from news on TV, internet and all other magazines. It is an essay. It is not a story. Even if you are telling a case story or a case study of someone, it's always an essay. It's not just about an individual or what he did or how he looked, you know, or what he ate, etc, etc, etc. It goes beyond, as the others have been saying, the simple curiosity satisfying thing. Because what Pankaj referred to was a new story initially. But there was a lot that went into what made these women. If you ask a question like what made these women take this very desperate and extreme step of disrobing themselves and going there in this kind of an act of defiance, what gave them the courage? So then you know there's a pre-story. Now the protest is on, you capture it. What happens further? You know, so it's a process. Like Aditya said, it doesn't end. So you start and structuring the reality, then you start taking in different points. I mean, I remember many years ago, we had at FTI a visiting uh, person from BBC. And the same question was asked to him about, you know, we know that the balancing side and two sides. He said, yes, yes, we were also asked this question in BBC. And we said that, okay, now one of the counters that these people gave, now in England they have this unique sense of humor. So he said, excuse me, sir. They asked that if the leader of the opposition was going to pick his nose when we were documenting him, would you ask the leader of the ruling party also to pick his nose for the sake of balance? What do you mean by balance? You know, you can, I mean, giving representation to both sides is completely fair. But at the same time, you as a program maker do carry a certain responsibility. Because you are, if the word is used, author. You are, it is your signature beneath that essay. So you can incorporate various views, but you cannot be viewless. You cannot simply say that I'm just putting it, I don't want to say anything. If you don't want to say anything, don't make We can have news reads. We can go and interview people. That's a sterile, so there is a sterile kind of documentation, which we should be also very careful with. But documentary involves, at various levels, Anand Patwadhan involves himself, the documentary, in a very different level altogether different level. Somebody else might do program on the same thing, he will look at it from a different viewpoint, which is what makes the word 
very interesting and which is what makes the possibilities of expressive possibilities and the extend the language of documentary and as i as uh, one can see there are various examples i'll just screen a short example for you i'll briefly tell you about this context i'll show you from a clip about a few minutes from the film that i myself made it is about a social issue uh, it is called punar janma i was coordinating a program for uh, funded by UNDP for FDI, we were making what the project was called as Films for Human Development and the state governments were participating, okay. It was, all government agencies were involved in that and it was called as a program Films for Human Development because the Human Development Index was something that the UNDP uh, swears by. Planning Commission of India was overseeing the entire project. so. It wasn't very easy life dealing with UNDP at one point and then on the other hand independent filmmakers. So uh, Mr. Tipurari Sharan who's at present the director general of uh, Doodarshan, he was the director of FDI and it was his initiative uh, to get that project and I was uh, his deputy, he was working as a coordinator. So what we hit upon was that we said that let us get an interface with the bureaucrats right from the beginning, the state government representatives of human development cell. Some of them were senior members, senior secretaries also of some state scale there. UNDP people, planning commission people and we had filmmakers in batches and we assigned them states and we said that okay first you go there and the domains were given to them, one or two days we had a session and a couple of days orientation were given on the various parameters of human development and the domains were given like say gender issues, uh, literacy, health, uh, livelihood, these are four or five such domains were identified and the filmmaker was said that you coordinate with the state government person, go to the field, find your subject, nothing will be given on a dotted line to you and then you have to come back one month later and make a submission of the script and the idea. So uh, this particular film which I made at that point, what I'll just briefly tell you in a minute while the titles are rolling, it will take uh, I've, another 30 40 seconds. So, this was the uh, agitation, the SEZ was a big issue those days. This was around 2005 2006. Okay, so there was a huge agitation in Man, where in Pune, which is Hinjaudi, you know, the IP hub and the uh, city is there. That is where the agitation was taking place, and there was a firing. These days, these kind of agitations and filings are very, very rare events. And it was right next door to Pune. So I felt, uh, in a sense, quite disturbed. So I just took out my two-wheeler one day and went straight into the village. Didn't know anyone. And started talking to people. I went to a pawn shop, I sat with at the shop and this thing. Then one thing led to another. Then they said that we have a committee, then we have organized this thing. So I spoke to various people, took my notes, just went looking around and somebody led me to that. Because it's a small place. And then Man is a village of about 6,000 people, which is just barely 3 kilometers away from the IT park. And the, the second phase of the IT park was coming in. You have TCS, you have Infosys, you have you know, Cognizant, you name the big IT company, Indian Broad, they have the big hub. Then the Rajiv Gandhi Biotechnology Park was coming up. That was the first phase they had given the land. The second phase was where they registered tooth and nail. And the whole thing erupted, there was a firing and I think one or two people died. You know, so I felt that this was a very extreme thing and suddenly I just, this is how my probe began. And initially what I wanted to do, my perspective was that when I submitted the proposal, I had called it as Yugantar. Because I thought that this is a kind of, we are on the cusp of change and this is the problems of some of the things that we go through in the process of development. I changed it to Punar Janma because of course I won't be able to show you the entire film, it's 33 minutes, because of something that that word came up. Because I realized that during this, what displacement means. Everybody was saying in the papers it was coming, the government is paying 10 lakhs, you know, to them as farmers. So it's sort of, oh, they have a joint family, so somebody who has a 10 acres of land gets a crore for the family. So what's the big deal? What are these people complaining about? This is the idea that a lot of people said. So I said that yes, it is there, but there must be some reason. So it is this, with this understanding or with this kind of notion of things in my ear, I went there with an open mind. And the picture that it emerged uh, made me think about this whole thing completely differently. And uh, so I began with, this is Magarpatta, very famous township uh, in Pune. 
So this is where I begin. And then I gave it a kind of perspective. I, as I spoke to various people, the parents, <coughs> farmers, I began to understand the problems and this is a problem immediately in the vicinity of the city. So that is how I begin my film and I'll show you the first three or four minutes and then I'll just briefly talk about it. <laughs> परंतु या शहरांच्या वाढीत नियोजन कमी आणि बेशिस्तच अधिक आहे अपेक्षेबाहेर वाढलेल्या शहरांना जमिनीचा तुटवडा भासतो मग शहरांचं त्यांच्या आसपासच्या परिसरावर आक्रमण सुरू होतं शहरांच्या लगतच्या शेत जमिनीवर याचा मोठा ताण पडतो पुण्याच्या एका बाजूला असलेल्या वानवडी कोंढवा या परिसरामध्ये अवघ्या दहावीस वर्षांपूर्वी शेत जमीन होती यावर आज विश्वास बसणं अवघड आहे इथं जमिनीचे हजारो कोटी रुपयांचे व्यवहार झाले परंतु मूळ जमीन मालकांच्या विशेषतः छोट्या शेतकऱ्यांच्या हाताला यातलं काहीच लाभलं नाही त्यांची स्वतःची जमीन गेली आलेले पैसे भल्याबुऱ्या मार्गाने खर्च झाले आणि मग त्यांच्यातल्या काही जणांवर स्वतःच्या जमिनीवर उभे राहिलेल्या इमारतींमध्ये रखवालदारी आणि धुनी भांडी करण्याची पाळी आली पुण्याजवळ हिंजवडीला जे आय टी पार्क उभं राहिलं त्याकरता शेत जमिनीचं संपादन करण्यात आलं माणगावच्या शेतकऱ्यांनी पहिल्या तीन टप्प्यांकरता जमिनी दिल्या पण चौथ्या टप्प्यात त्यांची उरली सुरली शेती आणि राहती घरं जेव्हा संपादनाखाली आली तेव्हा एक उग्र आंदोलन उभं राहिलं एम आय डी सीला एक इंच जमीन देणार नाही हा निर्धार झाला गोळी बारापर्यंत प्रकरण गेलं या भागाचं खूप चांगल्या प्रकारचं डेव्हलपमेंट होतंय प्रगती होते हे दिसतंय शासनाला किंवा बाहेरच्या लोकांना परंतु इथले जे मूळ रहिवासी आहेत ह्यांच्या प्रश्नाकडे मात्र शासनाने किंवा इतर लोकांनी किंवा जे काही लोक ह्यामध्ये प्रगती म्हणतायत करायचे त्यांनी दुर् संपूर्णपणे दुर्लक्ष केलेले आहे कारण खरं प्रगती ही इथल्या प्रॉपर लोकांची झाली पाहिजे मौजे माणगाव उर्फ माण मुळशी तालुक्यातलं हे सर्वात मोठं गाव आहे हिंजवडीपासून माण अवघ्या तीन किलोमीटर अंतरावर आहे पण सुविधांच्या बाबतीत हिंजवडी आणि माणमध्ये खूप मोठं अंतर आहे कच्चे रस्ते तुटक्या छपराची सरकारी शाळा रोज तासनतास गायब होणारी वीज ही माणची परिस्थिती आहे पण सुपीक शेत जमीन मुबलक पाऊस आणि कणखर शेतकरी ही देखील माणची वैशिष्ट्य आहे it went on then i took up three other cases one was a successful rehabilitation also of the government program of which i found evidence that figures in later on actually which some of the journalists told me incidentally and they asked me to see the one of the ministers uh, who incidentally was my senior in college but uh, i had not known about his work so i went and met him also and i got a view from of those people from there and there was another one which was the dam austies you know and the double age uh, nature of the development came through they were living in it was in solapur district ujni which is the largest reservoir of maharashtra state actually and which was like a very rain shadow area you see a lot of prosperity in that area but the other forms of development the other problems and the kind of tribulations people had to go through in displacement or development was was what so i took up these three cases uh you know of this variety of this film moving from here but this is just the kind of bringing so to give you an idea that you present an argument you present views of reality uh, etc the first film is a small uh, film about uh, a school started by the displaced chakmas in arunachal pradesh the kids are all first generation learners their parents are farmers who live in tree houses they coming down from there to go to school
insist the all converging to one small school. The idea was to get to know him as an individual first before we enter the film. This is a film I'm currently working on. The state makes those for reasons which are state functions, say recording the history of the country. So we, we record events, cultural events, political events, social events. We record events to preserve audiovisual record of cultures or vanishing languages, vanishing lifestyles. An individual filmmaker makes non-fiction films for his own passion, for his own satisfaction, for his own creative expression. An organization would make films maybe for information or for passing on its own message. One common thread that goes through them all is that unlike Big Boss, there is no financial model available for either making these films or for preserving these films for posterity or for promoting these films or taking them to audiences. So that is where uh, I feel, you know, Films Division as an organization uh, continues to find a relevance uh, even today. And the relevance is in all the three fields. One, as a state organization, there are some state functions which we uh, need to discharge. Uh, creating or recording of the audiovisual history of the country on the go for posterity. So that we record it and we keep it. And an audiovisual record is a kind of the most neutral record of events in a country which is open to interpretation by different scholars at a different stage unlike the written history which brings in it you know a very strong element of filtration of the author there would be some filtration in audiovisual documentation as well but it still uh, you know renders itself open to a lot of different interpretations on the basis of the factual material that is captured so that is one function that we continue to discharge and we shall continue to discharge. The second function is to help the independent filmmaker uh, give creative expression to the kind of non-fiction films that he wants to. And to that end, uh, you know, the Mumbai International Film Festival, MIF, which is uh, an international film festival, or the promotion of, uh, uh, say, screening spaces or creation of screening spaces which is being done in a program called FD Zone, or funding or commissioning or distribution 
these are aspects which actually uh, help an individual artist, filmmaker as an artist, to have his say and to also convey his message to a larger audience. And to that uh, end, uh, what we what we envision for Films Division and also for the overall independent uh, movement in the country is that there has to be a, a structured, uh, more uh, formalized approach towards audience development which is very necessary so that people don't only look at Big Boss, they also start watching, appreciating, comprehending and enjoying different kinds of films. And not merely commercial, you know, Jaiho or Big Boss or not. Films which are obviously made for money and not for any artistic, intrinsic artistic value. Also, to keep or allow an independent filmmaker to develop as an artist, to uh, perform his uh, art to a larger audience. Uh, so first I would like to you know, very briefly tell you about uh, the Mumbai International Film Festival, the new edition that is taking place. Uh, I would in fact invite all of you to come there and actually uh, enjoy the films. We are bringing more than 400 films from all over the world. Different genres, different uh, styles, different tastes, different flavors to that. Uh, this will happen from 3rd of February to 9th of February. Uh, the delegation registration is on and it's extremely cheap in the sense that for students it's only 50 rupees for the whole period. So the, the registration is only to keep a check on the number of delegates who come because the seats there are limited. But what we are trying to do starting from this edition of MEF is open it up to become more participative in the sense that it is not a state organized film festival any longer. There are a number of independent filmmakers who have been put together in the effort and we are also trying to increase the constituency of the uh, um, uh, cinephilia through this so that more and more people start enjoying the flavor of documentaries and also start realizing the power that is inherent in the so-called actuality films, which is much stronger uh, than the power of cinema as expressed in the fiction films. There would be a lot of master classes, there would be a lot of discussions. There is a strong vertical on preservation, restoration and archival of films for independent filmmakers as well as uh, home video filmmakers because a lot of People are now making their own home videos. So how, how to catalog them, how to put them, how to preserve them for your own uh, personal albums or libraries. Also, there's a strong vertical which we, are, which we have called outside the circle, you know, where the, the boundaries between different art forms are now blurring. And uh, what it means in terms of uh, the content, in terms of the form, what we used to call cinema or what we still call say non-fiction or fiction cinema, and a lot of artists are now moving from, uh, say, performance arts towards a fusion of visual arts and performance arts. Video installations or 3D installations. And a lot of interesting work is being done. So that exposition will also be brought in MIF. So a lot of exciting things are going to be there in MIF. And this year we are also starting with a small exposition of our market so that the very important question of how to fund films, your own personal non-fiction and short fiction films, how to take them to distribution, how to strategize for festival participation of such films and how to take them to larger audiences. Those are the verticals that will be discussed there. We are also setting up a National Museum of Indian Cinema in the complex of uh, Films Division and in a an year from now or maybe one and a half years from now the plan uh, is to develop that as a culture hub for cinema, for the wider aspects of cinema. We will have five theatres working there and we intend to start that as a cinema hub for alternative cinema including non-fiction and documentary films. So that, that becomes a, a place uh, for congregation of people who have interest in that kind of cinema and there would be constantly activities organized, workshops, sessions, master classes, interactive sessions and maybe this kind of an uh, event would really find Films Division as a proper venue uh, about one and a half years from now. Uh, of course, any more suggestions are also welcome. Uh, I'm really grateful to Anil and the organizers of this for this opportunity because I believe non-fiction 
and my documentaries are an extremely important part to preserve and promote the art of the form of cinema, art of the medium of cinema. And the one-sided exposure that is being given to uh, the general audiences, particularly the young audiences through internet or through computers or through television or through the commercial cinema, is, is giving them an extremely lopsided view of what the form or what the content or what the shape of this art is. And I believe it's very important for the development of the art and also for the development of the medium that this balance is restored and we expose the younger children, young, the uh, youngsters who will in future take to this kind of a form in a much deeper way with a much better engagement if they start now. So that in process of engagement has to be started now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.